The date is November 9, 1967. A little over nine months ago, the Apollo 1 fire consumed three men and shook a nation's confidence in its race to the moon. The pain was still raw, the investigations still echoing through the halls of NASA. The public was hungry for progress, for a sign that the dream was still alive. And there it stood, on a launch pad in Florida, the most powerful machine ever built by humanity, 363 feet tall, six and a half million pounds of thrust, the Saturn V. This was not a building block test. There were no dummy stages, no half measures. This was an all up test. Every stage, every component, every engine, live, fully fueled, fully functional, a single high stakes gamble to prove that the entire system could work from ignition to re-entry. The very idea was audacious. It flew in the face of decades of conservative rocketry philosophy. Werner von Braun, the architect of the V-2 and the Saturn rockets, was a proponent of the step-by-step -step approach. You test the first stage, you perfect it. Then you add the second, then the third. It's logical, it's safe but it wasn't fast enough. And with the sting of Apollo 1 and the Cold War clock ticking, NASA leadership under George Mueller made the call. It was all up or bust. They would bet the farm on one single perfect flight. To understand the magnitude of this decision, you have to look at what they were testing. This wasn't just a rocket. It was a symphony of independent yet interconnected systems. First, the S-1C first stage, powered by five monstrous F-1 engines, each one generating a staggering 1.5 million pounds of thrust. The total thrust at liftoff was 7.5 million pounds. These engines were an engineering marvel in themselves, operating at a combustion chamber pressure of 1,000 psi and burning RP-1 kerosene and liquid oxygen at a rate of 15 tons per second. They would burn for just 150 seconds, lifting the entire vehicle to an altitude of 38 miles. Then the S-2 second stage. It used five J-2 engines, burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, a super cold, high energy fuel that was notoriously tricky to work with. The S-2 had to ignite at altitude, separate cleanly from the first stage, and accelerate the stack to over 15,000 miles per hour in just six and a half minutes. The S-2's engines produced 1.14 million pounds of thrust and operated with an extremely high specific impulse, making it highly efficient for the climb out of the atmosphere. Finally, the S-4B third stage. This was the workhorse that would perform two crucial burns. The first to put the spacecraft into orbit, and the second in a later mission to perform the translunar injection burn that would send Apollo to the moon. On this flight, the S-4B would reignite after three hours in orbit to simulate that lunar-bound push. 
firing for 289 seconds to increase the velocity of the command module by 9,056 feet per second, or 6,174 miles per hour, sending it on a trajectory that would mimic a lunar return. And on top of it all sat the Apollo Command and Service Module, a Block 1 spacecraft modified with a Block 2 heat shield, designed to withstand the searing heat of a 25,000 mile per hour re-entry from the Moon. The onboard data acquisition system, with its 1114 sensors, was capturing everything from thermal data on the heat shield to the precise gimbal movements of the rocket engines. Every data point was critical to validating the computer models and ensuring future missions would be safe. The countdown was the longest in history for a first flight, 49 hours. Every switch, every valve, every sensor was checked and rechecked. The weight of the world and the burden of three lost astronauts was palpable. When the clock hit zero, the five F-1 engines ignited with a thunder that shook the ground for miles. News anchor Walter Cronkite, reporting from a press site 3.5 miles away, famously exclaimed, Look at the building shake. The roar is terrific. He had to hold a large picture window in his studio to prevent it from being blown in by the shockwave, which was measured at 130 decibels at the launch pad and could be felt 30 miles away. Slowly, almost impossibly, the 6.5 million pound vehicle lifted off the pad on a column of fire. It was an act of pure, unadulterated power, a testament to a nation's resolve. The first stage burn was perfect. The separation was flawless. The S-2's J-2 engines lit on command, and then the S-4B placed the stack into orbit with a perigee of 115 miles and an apogee of 117 miles. In just 11 and a half minutes, the Saturn V, the most complex machine of its time, had worked exactly as planned. But the mission was far from over. The unmanned spacecraft was now in a highly elliptical orbit, climbing to an apogee of over 11,200 miles. This was a critical part of the mission, a cold soak test. The spacecraft was maneuvered to expose the heat shield to the frigid vacuum of deep space, preparing it for the extreme temperature shifts it would encounter on a lunar mission. The temperature on the sun-facing side of the command module reached over 250 degrees Fahrenheit, while the shadowed side plummeted to below negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit. This proved the thermal control systems of the spacecraft were robust enough for a journey to the moon. After more than three hours, the S-4B ignited a second time, a short but powerful burst to send the command module hurtling back toward Earth at a velocity of 24,917 miles per hour, just shy of the 25,000 miles per hour a returning lunar mission would hit. The Apollo 4 command module, a silent, uncrewed passenger, became a blazing meteor. The heat shield glowed with a temperature of over 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The onboard cameras, with their film and batteries sealed in a heat-resistant box, captured stunning, albeit brief, footage of the fiery re-entry. This was the moment of truth. The mission was a resounding success.
The Saturn V, for all its complexity and the risky philosophy that guided its development, had performed with near-perfect precision. It validated the design of the rocket and, just as importantly, the courage of the engineers who believed in the all-up concept. Apollo 4 was more than just a test flight. It was a statement. It told the world that the Apollo 1 tragedy, while devastating, had not broken America's spirit. It proved that the moon was not just a dream, but an engineering problem that could be solved. The flight paved the way for Apollo 6, and then for Apollo 8, which just a little over a year later would use that same magnificent rocket to carry men to lunar orbit for the very first time. When we talk about the moon race, we often focus on the dramatic moments, the footprints on the lunar dust, the words spoken from a quarter million miles away. But the true story, the one written in fire and steel and sheer will, begins not on the lunar surface, but with a silent, thunderous launch on a November morning, when the gamble of a lifetime paid off.